In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear Reverend Father, and dear faithful, traditional Catholics are people who want to continue with the same beliefs and the same practices as those who have gone before them in the practice of the Catholic faith these past 2,000 years of the history of the Catholic Church. And as traditional Catholics, we, we understand that, that there necessarily are going to be some things that change in this life over time, especially in the physical realm. As human history has gone on, um, humans have understood better the, the substance of, of nature, how nature works. And they've, they've accomplished many things to, to tap in to the powers of nature, powers like, like the power of electricity or the, the, the power of nuclear energy or thing, things like this. And so through this greater understanding of nature, we've been able to develop technology and, and many uh, amazing devices to make our lives easier, um, such as the electric light or, or the internal combustion engine uh, for the car and, and so on. And, and life is different. Life is very different from, from the way it used to be in the past. And we don't have a problem with that as, as Catholics. We don't have a problem in embracing you know, modern technology because it's not against the faith as such. We're not, we're not Amish. Um, the, the, the Amish somehow seem to think that, that these things are sinful of themselves. What, what we do have a problem with is the change of belief or the change of morality, not the, the change of the way you live your life in terms of the moral law, um, leaving, leading, for instance, an immoral life as opposed to a moral life, or changing the way that, that God is worshipped, worshipping him in a way that is more uh, disrespe that is disrespectful to God or puts man at the center. This is what we have a problem with as traditional Catholics because of the fact that, that our religion comes from God himself. And the, the things that come from man, they can change, they will change, they're always going to change. But the things that come from God cannot change. If he reveals a religion to us, if he reveals certain beliefs to us, certain way to worship him, then we simply cannot change that. We, we must respect it, we must observe it till the end of time. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why, why we don't like the, the new Mass. We, we want to worship and live the faith as it's always been lived by Catholics throughout the ages. They represent for us the true understanding of the doctrine that came to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be like them. We want to, to imitate them in the way in which they live the Catholic faith. And we would expect, I mean, that if, if they, they came to uh, the new mass today, their sensibilities would be offended. They would say this is disrespectful to God. And this is also why we try to hold on to practices from the past that, that may not necessarily have uh, a direct connection to morality. There, there are many practices in, in our faith that where you can't save, if you don't do it, you're not going to save your soul. However, these practices create for us a certain Catholic spirit. They create for us a mentality, an environment um, in which we live our lives where we can expect we're more likely to save our souls. And, and we, we want that as well. We, we want the authentic Catholic spirit when we're living our faith. Even in this modern world where everything has changed, we still want to hold on to that authentic Catholic spirit. And so we try to hold on to certain things which have been done away with um, in, in the modern church. They're, it's uh, not necessarily concerned with being a sin or not being a sin. But you, we think about abstaining from meat on Fridays, you know, no, no longer obligatory except during Lent, um, or like the, the, the question of, of the Eucharistic fast. Uh, now it's just a bare minimum of just an hour, but, but we try to observe a three-hour fast. We feel that it find it's disrespectful to God not, not to fast at least three hours before communion. Or the minor orders, uh, the, the steps leading to the priesthood. We, we hold on to the minor orders and the subdiaconate um, because these, these are in, important in the formation of, of a seminarian and also in our conception of the priesthood. So there's another practice from the past, from our, our Catholic past, um, that 
that we may think goes back even all the way to the apostles that I want to talk about today and encourage us to hold on to. It's one of those things, it's, it's, not, it's not like, you know, sin versus no sin, but it is a question of us maintaining an authentic Catholic spirit. And I'm talking about the ember days, the 12 ember days that occur throughout the year. Um, these, are, these are days of penance, traditional days of penance that the church bound her children to practice in the past. I mean, like, even if, as of a hundred years ago, it was Catholics were bound under pain of grave sin to observe the Ember Days. Now, of course, they're no more. And the reason why this is important, I, I think this is one of the, um, a, another one of those important traditional practices for us to hold on to is because we need mortification today. I think we all recognize that we live a softer life than people lived in the past, precisely because of these technological inventions that make our life easier. Um, if, if we're too hot, we turn on the air conditioning. If we're too cold, we turn on the heat. Um, if we want some tasty food, we go to King Supers, and there's like all kinds of food from, from all over the world there available for us. If we want to get somewhere, we just hop in the car and turn, turn the, the key and we drive down the road, you know, at 70 miles an hour or however fast you drive. You know, it's, it's just life is very easy for us today. And, and the easier it becomes and, and the more we, we engage in these conveniences without keeping our will detached, the softer our will becomes. And it's so necessary in our pursuit of salvation which is something difficult. It's difficult to attain eternal life. It requires a great strength of will. And that's why we, we've always, as, as Catholics, had a spirit of mortification, had a spirit of practicing penance. We know that, that our will needs to be sharpened. It needs to continually be sharpened for us to be able to love God as we ought to. Uh, proper mortification is, is an indispensable prerequisite for loving God as we should. Loving God is primarily a question of our will. You think about just, just us uh, kneeling down to pray or us coming to Mass. And we, we are here to worship God. But each one of us we, at Mass, we have a greater or lesser engagement in the Mass. We have a, a greater or le lesser uh, submission to God. A spirit of adoration when we come to Mass. What's going on? Well, part of it is, is the level of, of our mortification. It takes mortification. It takes self-discipline to be able to come to Mass and forget about our life and think about God and give ourselves to God when we come to Mass. What, what naturally happens to us is we come, we come to, to church and we kneel down, and like the first few seconds, we're, we're focused on God, and then immediately we have these thoughts flood into us, these imaginations. We're thinking about what happened to us yesterday, or there's this thing going on in my life, or we're thinking about our future. What am I going to do the rest of the day? And I'm going to do this thing or that thing. And these thoughts are pleasurable to us. It's pleasurable for us often to remember the past. It's pleasurable for us to think about the future. And if we're going to focus on God, we, we have to be willing to mortify ourselves. We have to be willing to, to suppress these things, to put, to put these things aside. It comes from our spirit of mortification. And of course, this, this is something that, that goes on every single day of our life in our engagement with our Lord um, and our desire to draw closer to him. And it determines ultimately, it's going to determine ultimately whether we make it to heaven or not. Think about all the decisions we have to make each day as to what we're going to do. And there's sometimes a conflict between my will, what I want to do, and what I know God wants me to do. And, and who's going to win out? It's going to be determined by my willingness to give up my will. And that's going to be contingent on my spirit of mortification. So, unfortunately, in the church today, <clears throat> there's almost a total absence of any binding mortification. Almost all obligation of fasting and abstaining has been removed. There's only two days 
of fasting in the entire year whereby the church requires us to fast on our pain of grave sin. By fasting, I mean we eat less food. We're obliged to eat less food. You have one normal meal in the day and then two smaller meals that together do not equal the normal meal. And there's only seven days left where we're obliged to abstain from meat. So abstinence is a question of what you eat. Fasting is a question of how much you eat. Fasting, you eat less food. Abstaining, you do not eat a certain type of food, namely meat. So there's seven of those days. And if, and if I look in the, um, at like the Angelus calendar, which, which tries to track, the, it, it has there for you the practices that used to be. I count 49 days of fasting and 91 days of abstaining in the year, is what it, what it used to be. Um, so these days have been, have been dropped, and it's, uh, if, if, if we drop them out of our lives, um, then we lose that constant spirit of mortification that's necessary for our direct, us to direct our lives to God. And it's kind of ironic because, as I say, we, we kind of need more mortification. We have a greater need of mortification today than we did in the past because we live a, a softer life, but we're not as obliged to do mortification. So that's why it's so important for us to maintain practices like the Ember Days. Archbishop Lefebvre, he wanted the, the members of the, of the society to observe the Ember Days, so it's, it's part of our rule, and it's, it's the rule for the, um, the members of the Third Order of, of the SSPX to, to observe these Ember Days. And it's striking to me that, you know, the, the church, Holy Mother Church, she has to make prudential decisions. She says, do, do I bind my children under pain of sin to observe these practices, knowing that some will disobey and fall into sin? Or do I not bind them? And in the past, she chose to bind her children in this way. And the reason is, of, of course, because she truly thought prudentially that my children need to be this mortified if, if they want to make it to heaven. So let's talk a little bit about, about these ember days. The word, the word ember um, is not helpful. When we think of ember, it has a meaning already in, in the English language. It, it means like the remnants of a smoldering fire. Um, but the word ember has no relation to that meaning whatsoever. Um, it's, it's a corruption. The word ember is a corruption of two Latin words. The Latin words quator tempora. Quator tempora means the four seasons. And over time, uh, quator tempora became ember in English. So you can think of the Ember Days as the Four Seasons Days. The Four Seasons Days. And that, that will actually represent to your mind what they are. There, there are four times in the year, during a week, where you have three days of fasting and abstinence. Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. And these four times correspond to the Four Seasons. The reason why I bring this up today is because this week is one of those times. So this week we have three Ember Days on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Why does the church have these days? Well, as I say, for one reason, it's, it's just good for us to maintain a spirit of penance throughout the year, and not just think that, well, Lent is the time for penance, and, and the rest of the year, you know, it's just you, you enjoy yourself. Um, but to keep a spirit of penance throughout the year. Besides this, the church uh, proposed to her children these, these ember days for us to give thanks to God for the fruits of nature. Um, you think about how God has designed nature with the four seasons, where you have spring is a time for planting, uh, summer is a time for the crops to grow, uh, fall is, a, is the time for the, the crops to be harvested, and winter is a time for the ground to rest. And there's, there's a cycle that produces our, our food um, by the design of God. And it's nice to have four, these four occasions of, of the four seasons to thank God um, by, by doing some penance for his goodness to us. It just makes sense. So there's four sets of ember days. The first one in the liturgical year occurs during the third week of Advent. The second ones occur during the first week of Lent. The third ones during, occur during the week of Pentecost. And the fourth ones occur the week after the Feast of the Holy Cross. And that's the ones for this week because we have the Feast of the Holy Cross on Thursday. 
And there was this rhyme um, in English to help like school students or us remember when, when they come. It goes like this. Fasting days and emberings be, Lent, Wit Sun, Holy Rood, and Lucy. So the four times are, are Lent, Wit Sunday, which is Pentecost, Holy Rood, the Feast of the Holy Cross, and Lucy, December 13th, the Feast of St. Lucy. So that's, that's when the ember, ember days come. Each of these days has a special mass designed by church, by the church, and, and they're still um, there in, a, in the 1962 missile that, that we use. And as I say, when we, we still have these masses, they're still there, we have to observe them, but we're no longer obliged to do the penance and the fasting that's associated with them. So this week, there will be a special mass on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. They're all in the color of purple because they're penitential masses, and some of them have extra lessons that refer to the season or refer to the practice of penance. Um, Wednesday, on Wednesday, there's two lessons. On Friday, there's one lesson. And on Saturday, there's six lessons. And that's pretty much the case for all the Ember Days. The lessons for this Wednesday, for instance, um, they refer to harvesting and enjoying the fruits of the earth. Then in the Gospel of the Mass, it's the story of the apostles trying to cast the devil out of, out of a man, and they're unable. And then our Lord casts them out. And our Lord says, this one is only cast out by prayer and fasting, showing the, the fruits of, of fasting. Then you can look at the Mass for Friday and see that the, the lesson from Isaiah, um, it, it compares the people of Israel to a plant, and it says that God is like the dew, watering the, the plant of, of the people of Israel, uh, like if they're a lily or a, a blade of wheat or an olive tree, and they bring forth spiritual fruit, a, a spiritual harvest. And then the gospel speaks of Mary Magdalene doing public penance by anointing the feet of our Lord and wiping his feet with, with her hair. So again, this theme of harvest and, and the fruits of penance. And for Saturday, I'll, I'll leave you the homework assignment of, of looking at the Mass for, for Saturday in those six lessons. And I, I think you'll find the same sort of theme, it's reference to harvest and the fruits of fasting. So my dear faithful, these these four sets of ember days are really beautiful part of our Catholic heritage. According to Pope Leo the Great, who was Pope during the 400s, these days, the observance of these days go all the way back to the apostles. So this is, this is just like a, a, a tradition, perhaps, that, that was from the very beginning of the practice of our Catholic faith. Um, unfortunately, uh, Pope Paul VI did away with them in 1966, but we can think about um, this desire that we have to be like the Catholics of old. And how many millions of Catholics, for, for them, the Ember Days was just part of their life. And it helped them mark, mark the seasons and unite themselves with God at those seasons. So let us hold on to these important practices um, so that we can have that, that same spirit as our forefathers in the faith and truly um, dispose ourselves to love God and so attain the salvation of our souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.